it. Okay. Um, so hi again. Uh, Hello again. Uh, can you say first your uh, name, maybe the age and uh, where you are now? <clears throat> so my name is uh, Alexandru Echa. Uh, I usually go for Alex. I am 30 and I'm in uh, Romania, Sibiu, lovely Romania, Eastern Europe. Mm. Uh, where in Romania, uh, once again? You said Sibiu. Sibiu. It's <clears throat> it's smack in the middle of the country. Ah, so like uh, Wuj, uh, my uh, city, uh, which is like in the very center. Ah, okay. And uh, and the place you are sitting now is your office, or? No, this is uh, <clears throat> this is my living room. It's much more comfortable than my office, and it has a uh, better light, which is more. Uh, I thought that would be more adequate for the interview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, gosh, I wasn't aware you are so young. <laughs> I mean, of oh, course, really? you look uh, young, but uh, oh, not yeah. that there is like a 10 dif age difference between us. Because oh, well, well, yeah. yeah, but Camilla, you, you know me. I'm an old soul, Camilla. I'm an old soul. <laughs> yeah. I know you just a little, but I remember. Yes, that's the age, is, the age is just on my ID. It's, I'm an old soul. Also, okay, so the, the questions uh, that uh, will f follow are, in fact, uh, about you uh, as a person, you as a human being, so you... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I checked up the format beforehand. I, uh, I wanted to see how the interview go and what's the... Yes. Uh, yeah. Kind of what's the, you know, the format of it. Mm -hmm. uh, gotta tell you, didn't like what I saw that much. <laughs> So and I'll I'll, t I'll tell you why afterwards. But uh, yes, yeah. Go. Uh, you can shoot the questions. Um, yeah. So the question is about you and how, how you would define yourself. How would you, yeah, who you are as a person? Uh, <laughs> so how would I define myself as a person, as a yeah. as a human? Right. Okay. Well, to be completely honest, I uh, I'm just a pretty much as a person, I'm a very regular person. I have things that I'm into. I enjoy a good talk with a friend. I enjoy a good lunch. I like having a good drink once in a while. I'm just a regular person. Mm -hmm. And w what about this old soul you mentioned? Ah, the, the old soul. Well, that was, uh, well, besides the factoring in the joke material of it, because I think it's uh, it's important to be able to, you know, joke and not take things seriously once in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that maybe I have a uh, I have some things regarding myself which uh, maybe tend to make me appear a bit older. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so, with that goes this kind of, uh, as you said, uh, joking attitude a little bit, or not, uh, not to be uh, too, too long in this serious mo mode, seriousness mode, as I... Okay, well, um, yeah, I can talk a bit about that. So I, I think I always enjoyed this. I've enjoyed made, making other people laugh and coming up with funny things. So uh, maybe I'd come up with something that's funny which only regards a joke with one person and I'll remember it and I'll just be excited for it. And uh, that's, uh, that's something that I've liked my whole life, I think. And, uh, but also I think it's important even for me as a therapist, right? And for me as a man, uh, just to be able to relax and laugh about things from time to time because I think that's also some, a staple of maturity, okay? So I, I do feel that if there's something uh, deeply troubling to me in these times, it's that it's become so difficult to talk about things, which is ironic in a way, right? Because, uh, you know, we, we are like having this conversation from two different countries and communication is so easy 
the, the facility of communication is so easy, but again, it seems harder to talk about things and uh, without people getting offended. People get easily offended nowadays, Camilla, right? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. say more, say more. Uh, yeah, you have arrived to that point and I wonder. Mm. Well, uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, well, we can, I suppose we can get into this. So I, I think, I think these days, okay, people are very touchy, They're very, very touchy and very sensitive about things like, uh, uh, I've, I've, oh, oh my God, that offended me that you have touched on my dignity as a human being. How dare you say that to me? I am a, I am a, let's say I'm a white woman. How dare you? My life is difficult. We have been oppressed. It's, it's so hard sometimes to just uh, be able to have conversations about certain things. And I think being able to at least joke about it yes. is important. Mm -hmm. and so, so that's why I think there is a time and a place to take things seriously. And I think there is also room enough to joke about things, to have, to be lighthearted. Hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and how people react to uh, your, your jokes, is it, do they take it lightly or this depends, this depends on, on, yeah, the circumstances, the people themselves? Well, um, Usually, so if you're asking me, I, uh, I think that people find me hilarious. I think they love my jokes. Um, and if they don't, uh, they obviously don't have good taste. <laughs> but that's my opinion. I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe don't, they don't like my jokes all that much. But I think there's a fine. So look, I think there's a fine line between somebody being mean, right? Somebody being vicious or mean spirited or uh having the intention to offend or to shock or flat out to hurt someone and someone just trying to like you know let off some steam and not take things so seriously right things don't have to be so serious all the time i'm am i uh, so serious all the time uh, yeah well, uh, you know it's it's been a while it's been a while but uh from 2016, right? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't think you were that serious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe, maybe this will help. I, when I say serious, I do equate that with being boring or droll. And you were definitely not boring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is about, this part is about uh, um, my being. Um, um, well, you asked me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I... Uh, I wonder then, um, can you can you say what uh, your values are? Maybe, maybe it is possible. <clears throat> what my what my values are in a general sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, my values, and uh, I'll I'll try to strip this to the bare bones. You know, uh, so. I told you that I, I didn't like a lot of what I saw in the other interviews because I just felt that, uh, you know, questions like this. So for example, when you ask, what are your values, right? Mm -hmm. Some people just get this uh, inherent, uh, you know, a fawning attitude like, oh my God, I believe in being free spirited and open and just, uh, I, I like feeling love all around me. So I, I really, really don't like this, this way of fawning about things. So I do have a couple of values, okay? And I just, my, for myself, I just feel the need to counterbalance it. I mean, I'm a, a real genuine human. I get lazy. I get complacent sometimes. I get stuck, right? I, uh, sometimes I'm a hypocrite, right? Or I believe in a thing, but I don't do it. Or I do the complete opposite. So I think uh, we're all human and complex in that way. And if I'd have to just strip things to what are the real values that I believe in, they are very much uh, oriented towards myself and my lifestyle and towards my work ethic. So for example, for myself, I believe that I, um, 
I never really like to settle, mm -hmm. to settle into just, well, I can just do this and this and this. I, I enjoy develop, developing, right? I enjoy learning. I enjoy expanding my understanding. Um, I enjoy not getting stuck in just viewing something in a certain way. Um, and uh, as for my myself and what doesn't concern my work, I guess I could say that I appreciate honesty and I maybe make an effort to be honest and to be sincere with myself, with the people around me. Do I always do it? Hell no. No, it does not always happen. I do not always manage to be sincere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what about your passions? Uh, uh, My like hobbies or things that I'm passionate about? Mm -hmm. Well, to be completely honest, uh, I, I do get, uh, hold on a second, let me just, uh, I think I have the notifications. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my passions. Well, I, I'm, uh, I get easily into stuff. Mm -hmm. Like if I like a certain thing, then I, I like to research it and to find out things about it. And that's, that's one way my passions go. So for example, I, uh, if I get into, I don't know, let's say a sport, okay, like I get into basketball, I like to research to know a lot of things. I don't like basketball, but uh, that was an example. And, um, but what I'm truly, truly, truly passionate about is uh, the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that goes a bit beyond psychotherapy and beyond just the work I do in, uh, in my private practice. It just goes to developing my understanding of the human condition and of why things are in a certain way. And uh, it also goes into <clears throat> the methodology of psychotherapy, mm -hmm. right? So what I see a lot of is a lot of uh, young colleagues or people who go into psychotherapy training, they uh, finish their psychotherapy training, they finish they're training in that method, whatever that is. It, it could be Gestalt, it could be CBT, whatever. And they just get, get there, they get stuck in that, this is what I'm doing, and that's about it, right? That's all she wrote. I'm only doing this. I, uh, if somebody comes with a different perspective, you're just like, well, that's not how we do things. That's not how we do things. I don't know if you've ever heard this. This is a funny thing, right? I, I used to talk with a, uh, a friend of mine, uh, who's also a bit of a renegade like me. And uh, we talked about how funny it is that one of the things we often hear in Gestalt training is, uh, well, that's not Gestalt. No, that's not Gestalt, right? Mm -hmm. Which has like this sort of a, right? You, you've heard that. You've heard that, right? This isn't Gestalt. Oh my God, this isn't Gestalt. Which is funny to me, considering how Gestalt actually appeared on the scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing I'm passionate about. I am passionate about understanding how things work a certain way in therapy and how, uh, mm -hmm. how I can develop my thinking and my understanding of that to improve my work and to improve my knowledge of, uh, well, my knowledge of what I call the human condition because it's the closest term I could come up with to encompass it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be what I'm uh, really, really, really passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, and w what about uh, people that uh, have influenced uh, you in your uh, becoming who you are? Oh boy, well, that's, uh, that's another one of those questions, right? Like uh, I, I, could, I could go the Oscar route on that one. I'd, I'd like to thank my mother and my Lord Jesus Christ and all the people who supported me during that. So. Of course, there's been there's been people along the way who have helped me, who have supported me, who have, uh, you know, helped me along a great deal. And I, I don't neglect that in any way. I wouldn't like to name any of them, but I'll be honest with you. If you, When you ask me that question, the person, the real genuine person that comes to mind is myself. Uh -huh. Because I know the kind of work that I did 
I know the kind of uh, sacrifices I've had to, I had to make to get to what I'm doing now. I know the not sleeping, to write things, to think about things, the time spent to better my understanding. That was me. That nobody did it instead of me. Nobody, nobody did the work in my place. Mm -hmm. So that would be the person who I think is, uh, is most responsible for helping me along the way and sabotaging me along the way too. Mm -hmm. It's myself. And uh, so maybe what uh, were the different and complex contexts uh, you were behaving towards yourself this way? Uh, what different circumstances made you this way, I, I wonder? Oh, what, the, what are you referring to? What, huh? When like, you say made you this way, what are you, what are you uh, thinking about? Huh? Um, I'm thinking of uh, not only agency, but also field. Uh, uh, this agency is operating. So I wonder if like, I don't know, the turn of the 1880s to the to 90s was kind of critical in your biography or not really? Uh, was it maybe European crisis, you know, <laughs> just to- oh, Okay, oh, so like what was in my environment? Yes. <clears throat> my, my whole life. Okay. Well, um, I think, uh, well, I'll, I'll just take it from the start. So I think uh, how my family set up uh, is, uh, it was always going to produce uh, high achieving children, mm -hmm. because there was a big emphasis on academic success and uh, not selling and reading and intellectual activities and so on and so forth. Uh, I actually had a, a funny, a funny memory about this uh, with my, uh, I, I was talking with my father at one point and uh, we were, I think we were discussing some manual labor, something, some workers were doing. Some oh. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we were discussing some man work, right? And uh, that's, uh, that's something I've never excelled at. I, I, I would have loved to be more handy with my hands. Uh, I never, never really got there though. Uh, and I was, then I remembered how he told me as a child, you know, that you want to learn hard so you can work with your mind, not with your hands, right? And that was a recurrent theme. Mm -hmm. So if you if you worked hard, you uh, you yeah. didn't have to work with your hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be that would be the influence in my family. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now that the other thing would be that I uh, I guess how I'm structured is that I always uh, I always wanted to achieve something that is maybe different, right? Or there is very much my own whatever that would have meant, because obviously I didn't want to be a therapist as a young child, right? If any young child wants to be a therapist, I would be very concerned. I would be concerned. I would, I would look at those parents and say, what did you do to that little kid? What's wrong with you? Um, but whatever I would have wanted to do, I knew that I wouldn't, would have wanted to do something that's very much my own and that is uh, quote unquote special, mm -hmm. right? So regarding that, I, always, I was always uh, fascinated reading about people's achievements, people who maybe achieved something the first time, or, uh, you know, people who broke new ground, who were the, the first people in the Amazon or the, the first in a foreign native land that nobody knew about. And, they were just looking around and said, oh my God, look at all this crazy shit here, Jesus. And I'm the first person, I gotta figure this stuff out. So I always found that amazing. And I've, um, I guess I've always wanted that for myself. And uh, that's stayed with me my whole life and it stays with me as a therapist. So if there is a certain issue that I think is a bit out there, but interesting, I, I don't know why I would, uh, I would, what, what I would, why I wouldn't dedicate my time trying to understand that and why I would do anything else. Mm 
So I'll give you an example on that because that's very vague. So for example, one of the uh, Jung's later ideas uh, right before he died was a, uh, well, I, I guess it wasn't so much of a hypothesis. It was more of a hunch he had that the unconscious, the inner world, the unconscious and the material world, the reality, were actually different representations of the same thing, right? So that's pretty out there. That's pretty out there, although not so much with the recent advances in quantum physics and so on and so forth. But that was, that's so interesting to me. That is so interesting to me, understanding the nature of reality through, uh, through the lens of the psyche is very interesting to me. Does it have clinical application in private practice? Probably not. Uh, does it have uh, immediate impact on, I don't know, saving the environment? Probably not. But is it worthwhile to pursue for myself? Definitely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm listening. Uh, mm. mm -hmm. So these are these would be the kind of things that I'm, uh, that, are, that really get me passionate. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess now in, uh, in, my, uh, in my recent years, I enjoy uh, what helps me is if I can connect and talk to people who are willing to think for themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll underline this really think for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. People who don't like buying into things, where whether it's, you know, things on the left with social justice, things on the right with conservative, people who just enjoy thinking for themselves, that is what I feel helps me because they help me think about things in a different way or think about things I would have never thought about on my own. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be something that helps me. Obviously, these people tend to be rare, but I do enjoy it when I find them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so you, uh, you now uh, addressed uh, back again this, uh, I, this question of, uh, about passions, but I also wonder about this environmental issue and uh, whether you would uh, name anything else besides the, the, the things you already mentioned uh, that uh, yeah, that impacted your life and uh, yeah, your auto definitions, if you like. <clears throat> well, things that impacted my life. Well, look, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't want to get into specific details because there, there aren't things in my life that are so radically different mm -hmm. from other lives. Um, you know, one of the first experiences I've ever had as a therapist is one that I think a lot of therapists, if not all therapists, uh, have, is that it's so easy to start seeing yourself in your client's struggles, right? It's so easy. Mm -hmm. And it's something that doesn't get talked about that much uh, in, uh, in, discussion, in discussing therapy. Doesn't, it doesn't really get talked all that often, although I, I, find, I find it very interesting. And my life is not really all that different. Yeah, I've had struggles. I've had, uh, you know, heartbreaks, success, lack of success, uh, tons of moments when I would have loved to give up mm -hmm. on pursuing whatever I wanted to pursue at the time, mm -hmm. moments where I was lost, moments when I felt like I was the king of the hill and nothing could touch me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've gone through all of that. And they all informed me and they all uh, contributed to building my character as it is today. Mm -hmm. If I could maybe, <clears throat> if I could maybe name something which I think is important out of all of those is uh, my work with clients. And I mean all the clients, all of them, even the ones that didn't work out, even the uh, the ones that abandoned therapy or that I couldn't connect with. Mm -hmm. All of my work with clients has, uh, has been a tremendous help to me 
as a person and as a professional. Just seeing the, uh, how should I put this? Just looking at that human struggle everybody goes through and looking at how real everything is, right? How real people's pains and struggles are. How, um, how difficult life can get at a certain point. How much, how much of a difference it makes when someone is willing to listen and to actually see you to actually see you, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. Because I feel, I, I feel that in regular life, and I think it's normal that it's like this, but I think in regular life, we, uh, we don't usually always engage each other as real people, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to the store to get my food and I'm paying the cashier. It's the cashier. I don't know what's going on there, right? Maybe she's grumpy one day, maybe she's nice one day and gives me a smile, but that's it. It's just the cashier. So uh, that, that sort of connection, I don't feel exists on a day-to-day -day basis always. But in therapy, you have that. You can bring that. You can bring that capacity to see someone as that person needs to be seen. And I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah. I. <clears throat> yeah. I. I. I wonder if. Um, if you could now say maybe more specifically about Gestalt th therapy. How did that all start? Uh, how did you come to Gestalt therapy? How I came to Gestalt therapy. Okay. Well. Uh, I think I, I first started my training in uh, Rogerian therapy, person-centered, mm -hmm. which, by the way, what kind of a name is that, right? Person-centered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> person-centered, like, not, 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 as if not all therapies. Person I, there are some therapy names which uh, just tick me off. This is one. The other one is positive psychotherapy. Come on, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how much can you go for branding? Mm -hmm. So I started uh, with person-centered approach. I think I went to about three, two or three workshops. Um, and in the same time, I was doing therapy in Sibiu with a Gestalt therapist. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that that helped me more. Mm -hmm. I just felt that was a lot more effective than what happened at Rogerian therapy. And when I, I just felt that that would be the right thing to do, I quit the Rogerian training and I, uh, I signed up for Gestalt training when the first, uh, the first new group got formed, which I think was in uh, 2013. Then I got the training and uh, the main uh, trainer in, uh, was uh, Carmen Bayer, who's uh, the head of the training institute in Romania. And uh, she's a great therapist, great, great therapist. Uh, she was uh, amazing for for me at that time. I was also very into therapy, being a student, and uh, she's just uh, very charismatic. She's very uh, fluid in the way that she works, and she impressed me a great deal. And I think that while you're in training, it's good to have someone to look up to. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got into Gestalt training. And I finished in 2015, the basic training, then started supervision. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I still haven't finished supervision. I have to, I have to uh, finish the case studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, with my, uh, my lousy work ethic consistency, I have not managed to do so yet, but I will. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, what made you uh, change uh, into into Gestalt? Uh, I mean, quit this Rogerian training yeah. and, and and started yeah and start. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's very easy. Uh, seeing how Gestalt therapy worked, I just felt that Rogerian therapy was very lazy. Uh -huh. It was a lazy, lazy form of therapy. Um, 
So the thought in Rogerian therapy is that some conditions you offer the client work to bring out the best in that client. And that is unconditional positive regard, empathy, blah, 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 listening, and so on and so forth. But that's all. Mm -hmm. So that, that's all. The therapist doesn't bring himself into the process. It's almost as if you just have a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, um, <clears throat> it's almost as if the therapist forces himself into that box. Well, I'll, ju I'll just be positive. I'll just be reinforcing and empathetic and open and I'll just listen and so on and so forth. But again, that's not bringing yourself as a real person. And I would argue not even bringing yourself as a real professional. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that was lazy and I felt that was not helping me. And if you want, I could get into even more specifics. So understanding my situation at the time, uh, being a, uh, I, I was always uh, quick with it. I could find my words easily. Mm -hmm. So that always helped me to, that always nudged me into a point of inflation yeah like inflation of the ego when i had a uh, a backdrop to be heard for people to listen to me to say oh my god that that sounded so smart you're so smart and that always uh, inflated my ego a lot and that wasn't that good for me because at, at a certain point it feels nice but then it just doesn't feel nice mm -hmm. it just feels a bit off you know, mm -hmm. and in Gestalt, it wasn't like that. I was being confronted. I was, uh, I was set, I was being set boundaries by my therapist mm -hmm. and that felt different. It felt uncomfortable, but I could see that it helped. So that made all the difference for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what attracted you uh, apart from that uh, during those years to Gestalt th therapy? Because you mentioned also that you are not, or at least I understood it this way, you are not any longer into Gestalt mm, yeah, uh, mm, kind of uh, uh, approach that much. Uh, but um, Well, I, I, I wouldn't put it that way. I would just say that me and Gestalt don't always see eye to eye. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. <laughs> and I, I, uh, if you want, I could talk a bit about that because <clears throat> I yeah. think it's, uh, it's good to talk about these things again, having conversations, right? Uh, politeness, that's killing us. So where me and Gestalt don't see eye to eye? Well, um, you know, I'll just go to the beginning. I feel that Gestalt therapy and I will defend everything that I say against anyone. I will have arguments with anyone who wants to have them with me. I have read as much as could be read of the, you know, backbones of Gestalt literature. I have tried to wrap my head around it. And one of the things that became clear to me is how little Gestalt therapy evolved as a methodology of therapy since the 50s when the main book appeared. And even today, honestly, breezing through contemporary Gestalt books and Gestalt um, trains of thought and so on and so forth, I still feel that the main book from the 50s is probably the most complex one of them all and the most interesting one and the one that is more, more uh, avant-garde in terms of ideas and in terms of what it actually brings to the table as... Um, as consistency of theory. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, l l let's, just, uh, let's just think about it. So how, how are Gestalt books usually written? I think we actually had a, a personal talk about this once. Mm -hmm. You take a concept, you, like, you, you take a concept, you're good at, or you're like, like Gestalt and body work, or Gestalt and uh, creative something, something, right? And you take the concept that you like, and you put it on the cycle of contact and then you explain it in terms of uh, background, foreground and so on and so forth. But that brings nothing new. That brings nothing new. I mean, there are some things in Gestalt that have never been adequately processed, I feel, and that haven't grown mm -hmm. with the times. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And I'll, I'll give you another example. Yeah, yeah. Let's just think about how Gestalt actually emerged in the first place. So it emerged firstly with Fritz Perls and his frustration with the psychoanalytic uh, academy or whatever. Uh, the, the lords of psychoanalysis of his time, right? His frustration with the, the big dogs of psychoanalysis. He had some ideas. He was a creative man. He was a, a man with a big ego and good for him, right? He was a smart guy. He had every right to have a big ego. Um, and they refused his, his ideas. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, gosh darn it. I don't like you people anymore. And I'm going to take my ideas and do my own thing. And again, great. It's great that he did it in that way. And uh, <clears throat> what I feel happened there is that it was this sort of almost like a familial backdrop where a edgy, but ultimately creative, good, smart teenager gets fed up with his parents and leaves home forever to do his own thing. But I think at some point when you grow up, when you mature, you come back home and you face those things. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by this is, uh, you know, there are so many issues I feel with Gestalt therapy that I don't even know where to begin. But since I opened the topic about psychoanalysis, can we have a talk about how in Gestalt we, have, uh, we admit the existence of the unconscious, but we operate without the theory of the unconscious because it would be with other theories in Gestalt therapy, because you know, we have so many things in it that, well, 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 let's just keep it vague. Let's just keep it vague so things don't contradict each other. But we admit the existence of the unconscious, but we don't have a theory of it. Mm. And we brush it easily, too easily aside by saying things such as, uh, well, even if things happen in your past, we might get to them in therapy, but what's important is the here and now, okay? And we treat it like that. And I think Fritz himself was credited as saying that uh, Gestalt is a therapy of the obvious at some point, mm -hmm. which again, kudos, that's great. That, that's a great novel idea for that time, but it's not always, therapy should not always be a therapy of the obvious. Mm. Um, and another big problem with Gestalt, <coughs> and I think this is, uh, this is probably the biggest problem I have uh, identified so far, is that Gestalt is, uh, has no working understanding of trauma. I think that's a big problem. You can't brush off trauma or understand trauma through an incomplete Gestalt. It's just not how it is. It's a lot more complex than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least in my country, there is, a, there is a growing trend of people who finish Gestalt training and go to have training on trauma work, mm -hmm. on a method of understanding and working with trauma, mm -hmm. because Gestalt does not have an understanding of that. Mm -hmm. And I think you can see, uh, if, you, if you want, you can see a consequence of that in the fact that Gestalt has found a very snug place where? In coaching, right? Mm -hmm. Because the way it's structured pertains itself very well to coaching, to empowering people and uh, being aware of yourself and just go get it, go after that. Mm -hmm. Act it out, act out your desires and your ambitions. And again, it's not a good idea all of the time. Mm -hmm. So these would be some issues I have with Gestalt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate you mentioned them. Uh, and they could be uh, discussed uh, each and every, every one. Uh, yeah, but we, we'd have to have like a five hour talk. For this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but it's exciting. And I hope you are doing it. Uh, yeah, on your, I mean, yeah, from time to time or uh, uh, or maybe yeah, doing and and the, and in fact, this is uh, my next question. Mm, yeah, how 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 do you, given the, what you said, uh, contribute to this uh, Gestalt methodology um, yourself? Uh, I, I I wonder. Mm -hmm. Well, towards myself is. Uh... <clears throat> Hmm. 
Well, I haven't. Uh, I don't feel that I've contributed to Gestalt methodology, but in regards to my the, my own private practice, the way I work with clients and the way I understand things. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I do is that I've uh, I've done my own research. Mm -hmm. I've done my reading. Mm -hmm. I have uh, so I did. Uh, I have done what I feel was the norm you know back in the day with the old therapists uh, where you go into your private practice you see what's happening you go back to the drawing board you start reading up and writing you go back and you see how that's going you go back you have this to and from mm -hmm. so that's kind of how i do things i try to understand things as they happen in my private practice then i read then i think about things uh, literally, I just uh, I just stand in my house and I just look at the ceiling and I think about things mm -hmm. and I try to better understand them. Mm -hmm. So the directions I've gone to were um, reading a lot more of psychoanalysis. That would be one. Um, I'm not particularly banking on any form of psychoanalysis. Although if, if it's just a matter of taste, of course I do enjoy Jungian psychoanalysis a lot. It's, uh, it's just very appealing to me. But I read, uh, I read up a lot of what psychoanalysts have written because they understood things I feel a bit better in the sense that they understood that this method, this thing will, we're all working towards which is psychotherapy, needs to better understand the conditions of humanity. And one of those is trauma and uh, the ripples trauma leaves in the whole human sphere, right? And they have written a lot about this, a lot. And I mean a lot. They have written quite a great deal. And I'm very, <clears throat> I appreciate a lot, for example, the works of uh, Donald Kalshed. Uh, he's only written two books, but I feel that he's written books the way I'd like books to be written by professionals in the sense that he uh, makes a synthesis of a lot of different modes of viewing a certain thing. In this case, it's trauma. Mm -hmm. And uh, he tries to look at a broad spectrum and tries to come to better understandings mm -hmm. and not just to sell a catchy idea. Which, uh, which is what I feel happens a lot in psychotherapy nowadays, right? We uh, strive a lot to be catchy. We strive a lot to find things that could be, uh, you know, marketed easily either to people or to uh, medical companies. And uh, what's I'm very happy when I- What's his name? What's his Excuse name? What's his Donald name? Call, Donald Kalshit. Uh, can you uh, spell the? <coughs> yeah, yeah, it's a it's a difficult spell. So it's because K I... mm -hmm. K A L mm -hmm. okay S mm -hmm. C H E D okay hmm. yeah I mean I myself uh, uh, read I'm reading yeah psychoanalytic uh, literature but. Uh, Never came across actually, even in the references. But uh, maybe uh, some contemporary. I he's he's contemporary. Well, he I think he's pretty old now, but he is he is contemporary. He's written just two books, I think, uh, fifteen years apart. Okay. But they're great books. They're tremendous books. Okay. I, I enjoyed them a great deal. And well, well, he's not the only guy. So there there are a lot of people. Yeah, of course, I feel like the people writing about trauma uh, tend to get to more deeper deeper uh, ways of understanding the human psyche uh, or you know that there's also um, Besser, Besser von der, yeah I can't pronounce his last name, the Dutch guy, the yeah. Dutch trauma guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah he's also pretty great. So that would be one issue I do have with Gestalt. It does not have adequate ways of understanding trauma. And I would even say that some of the things that are intrinsic in the architecture Gestalt applies to therapy is actually detrimental to patients struggling with trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
um, yeah so uh, 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 again uh, like uh, the, the question uh, the, 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 the question was uh, uh, yeah was m m m more about the way you uh, you work now uh, and uh, what oh. do you yourself do with clients and with this methodology in your practice okay so okay you yeah yeah psychoanalysis mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what i do is this um i am a lot more open mm -hmm. i am not in the a a little mental box labeled this is gestalt uh, the rest isn't gestalt and i must be in this uh, gestalt box so i'm a lot more open to different things um, I am open, for example, to the fact that some people do not find the Gestalt way of working with clients easy for them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think, again, I'm, I'm sure you must have had this experience when you ask a client how he feels about something and they just can't answer. They just can't answer. Mm -hmm. Now, forcing that client to answer mm -hmm. is a mistake I've made in the past and it is a stupid mistake. It is a very stupid and ignorant thing to do. Mm -hmm. Some people just have this difficulty. So I have this sort of openness. If a person can talk about his emotions, okay, we can talk about something else. We can get, we can have other ways of getting to what's actually causing distress and suffering in his life. Mm -hmm. We have all these many tools. We can easily get to it. Mm -hmm. So what I do is to try to um, fine tune my way of working to each client. And that can mean a bunch of different things, mm -hmm. but mostly what I have incorporated differently in my practice, which is very different from Gestalt, is educating my clients on certain aspects and explaining things, which, right, it's, it's a big Gestalt no-no, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I do this and, you know, it helps a great deal. Mm -hmm. especially things concerning uh, development, human development. Mm -hmm. I think those are very important. Uh, and things regarding how emotions and how the inner life works, that's also important. Mm -hmm. And even just a very basic, basic education on the psyche itself mm -hmm. usually helps a great deal. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I'll actually give you an example of something that I say and do very often. People usually have this idea, this fallacy of the psyche as just being something that you can will to do whatever you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. And they have unrealistic expectations of themselves. Like, I, I, uh, why am I suffering like an idiot? I wish I didn't suffer, so on and so forth. Why am I sad? I wish I wasn't sad and so on and so forth. Now I could go the gestalt lane pretty easily there. Like, uh, where do you feel your sadness in your body? Or how does this sadness feel? Uh, could you identify your sadness with an object in this room and so on and so forth. But a lot of the times it's so easy just to explain what's going on. And ways that I, I th that's also one thing that I work on is I try to find the best ways to explain things so that most people, most of the time, can have a grasp on it. And what I explain to people is that, look, when it's about our body, when we're thinking about our physical body, we usually have realistic expectations of it. Usually, not all the time, but usually. So for example, if you wanna walk up 10 stairs, you're probably gonna walk one stair at a time, maybe two stairs or maybe three stairs if you're trying to be cheeky. But you're not gonna wanna jump straight to the 10th stair because that's impossible. Or if you wanna climb a dangerous, slopey mountain, then you know that's gonna be hard. You know that's gonna be very difficult. And if you climb it, if you reach the end without dying, you're gonna have a tremendous sense of achievement because you just climbed a big mountain. So that's easy to understand in the physical fear, but the psyche is no different in that way of understanding it. Things are not easy. Mm -hmm. So for example, maybe if you're a shy guy, 
and you have difficulty talking to a girl, actually managing to talk to a girl while, while, while you're shitting yourself with anxiety is a great achievement. You've actually done it. Great. Wow, I'm amazed. And I am genuinely amazed. So when, when I know when I know my clients do a small thing that would seem so utterly insignificant to anyone else, but I know how difficult that was for them, I am excited. I am like, yes, that is amazing. Great. Bump the fist, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm. So that would be one thing that I've uh, I've modified in my uh, in my practice, just uh, educating clients and explaining things. I find it helps a lot. I find it's very effective and very easy. And I find uh, I I also I, I also have that I find that it's very easy for most people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in my life, um, well, in my life, I'm doing my best to better understand things and to. Uh, phrase them into words, to write them up when I can, and to uh, make a cohesive way of working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm hoping that I can do this in, in some time, in some years. I would like to uh, actually write up my understanding of how therapeutic methodology could work as effectively as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, so uh, maybe uh, speaking about the f future, and uh, the last question would be: uh, w w What do you think will happen with uh, with yeah with our approach with Gestalt ap approach? Um, yes, mm -hmm. seeing different tendencies within Gestalt therapy world itself, but also on the outside. Oh, well, uh, that's a tough one. That is a tough question to answer, but I'll do my best. Um, so the short and honest answer would be, I don't know. Me, Alex, I don't know. What I think is that it has, take, it has been a long time and Gestalt therapy has not managed to adequately grow. I think that is a problem. Um, I think it's a big, big, big problem. And I think it would be difficult. It would be a difficult hurdle to cross. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are some systems sometimes, and we, we can talk about all kinds of systems, like uh, modes of thinking, political thought, states that just can, and even people, right? Even people. Some people would rather break than change. And I feel that, again, ironically, Gestalt might be in this situation. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, the tendencies that I'm seeing is for a lot of splinter Gestalt-esque approaches. You have your relational Gestalt, your, uh, I don't know, uh, all sorts of Gestalt-y things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I don't know what will happen with, uh, with this uh, this form of therapy and with this community of Gestalt therapists. I genuinely don't know. What, I, what does concern me more is, uh, you know, th the things I'm talking about with you, I, I don't see these things being talked enough. Mm -hmm. So I see my colleagues, I see people who are in this business, who, are in the, who, who have agency in this situation, and I just don't feel that people are thinking about this. I don't feel they really want to change things. And I don't feel that, uh, I don't feel there is sufficient agency for growth within the greater Gestalt community. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I hope that I'm wrong. I genuinely hope that I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually, uh, yeah. Uh... Well, you uh, re reminded me of, uh, uh, of the question I wanted to uh, ask you, and it is about, um, yeah, uh, I even uh, ver verbalized that one. Uh, um, how to put that? Um, 
Yeah, this is a, a, a bit about community uh, of <coughs> of of minds, or uh, uh, whether do you really have uh, uh, well occasion uh, to speak and discuss those things uh, with nope. people? Hmm. Nope, I don't. I don't. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'm going to go back into criticism. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't feel that people really want to have conversations. <clears throat> I don't feel that they want to have conversations. I feel like people hmm. are more interested in, uh, whew, how should I put this? So I'm seeing this tendency and again, it might just be me being a, a grouchy old soul oh. complaining about things, Come but, okay. but I, I don't really believe that though. Mm -hmm. So what I'm seeing is a lot of people, especially young people who uh, <clears throat> are very, you know, open-minded, new agey, uh, very drawn to gestalt and to the humanistic spectrum in general. And what I see that they are interested in, and, and I think this is uh, relevant in the community, is that they're more, mostly interested in themselves being seen, in people seeing them, seeing how open-minded they are, how generous, how conscious of community and ecology they are. And uh, I, uh, I have a, a great dislike of this. There's a, there's a term I like a lot. Uh, it's virtue signaling, right? Mm -hmm. I feel that people in the Gestalt community are very much preoccupied with virtue signaling, mm -hmm. more so than with actual facts and actually growing, actually developing this, mm -hmm. this way of therapy. And I, I don't feel, feel that this happens only in Gestalt. I feel that happens all over the therapeutic spectrum in a way or another. People are more interested in selling. People are more interested in things that are catchy or interesting or virtuous in a one way or another. So I, for example, am a, uh, I am a sworn enemy of the positivistic attitude, which I feel is infecting psychotherapy. And especially in Romania, because I have mo more contact with my colleagues here, uh, I despise it. I despise this rampant, stupid, ignorant positivism. Uh, when I when I see it, uh, you, you know, this emphasis on uh, unbridled love and caring, and uh, just uh, you just have to meditate, man, man. You just got Camilla. You have to meditate. It would change everything, and just feel the love around you. There's just so much love in the universe. You can just connect to that love. I hate this. I hate it. Hmm. I despise this. I don't feel that it helps. And uh, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Again, coming back to the, 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 the fact that I'm a real human being. When the COVID crisis started, I've seen a lot of these, these type of colleagues hit rock bottom. Because when the chips are down, right? When the chips are down, people aren't interested in bullshit. They are interested in what actually helps. And I've had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, colleagues in Romania, Luf's clients in that period. And you know what, Camilla, I was glad. I was glad, I was happy, and that's an ugly thing, but human. It's a human thing. Uh, okay, thank you very much uh, for this conversation. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, wow! <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, I enjoyed it uh, very, very much, and um, and yes, it wasn't easy. <laughs> okay. Easy. <laughs> you were you were right. Um, um, so um, thank you, and uh, and I will uh, actually contact you back channel. Uh, now I, I yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it's like a mode of uh, ending, and f thanks again. Thank you. Uh, you. Would you like yeah, to say something at the, for the ending or? Well, uh, I, I could do the classic Looney Tunes, right? Well, that's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay. no, I, I, I'd like to know uh, how it was for you. Uh, yes, it was um, um, irritating, inspiring, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and this need to discuss uh, I, uh, that I had to hold up. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, because because it's not about that uh, in this yeah. interview. But uh, that's uh, for that reason. I would like to, uh, yeah, connect with you uh, sure. uh, uh, later. And <clears throat> okay, so thank you. Uh, but, but I'm glad. I'm glad you said that. You know, the the need to react. These are conversations that have to have to happen, and they're yes. not happening. Yes, of course. They're just not happening. Uh huh. Mm. Why so are they that, happening? That part is said. Know. That part is said, and I. Uh, yeah, and I understand yeah. it very well. Uh, and right, yes. they're just not happening. Yeah, and today, yeah, I believe they m might, and that's why I will, yeah. Well, you know what I think? I think the politeness, that's killing us in this profession. Mm. We just have this uh, very uh, respectful, polite, uh, you know, uh, uh, self, uh, self-pleasuring, Mm. Uh, oh no, I don't want to offend you. Oh, oh, that's great. I don't want to offend you. Let's be friends. Ha 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 ha. And nothing happens, right? We never get to a real conversation. Mm. I think that's really sad. Mm. That's really sad for a, from a profession of therapists, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, thank you for bringing up those uh, yeah, different uh, ideas and uh, different um, mood, I would say. <laughs> mm. To this, to this well, I'm, I'm glad. I, I, I hope it was, uh, I hope it was infor informing and interesting, and um, yeah. I, uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, that's good to hear. Um, okay, so uh, bye for now. <laughs> See you. See you.